So, my perfect strangers. <laughs> You're so excited to talk about it. I am, I'm biased, so I, I've read the novel before I watch the show. Um, and I get a little bit nitpicky with how my Leanne Moriarty novels are handled um, in David E. Kelly's hands. Um, let's just go go over the show. If you were going to yeah. give people the lowdown on Nine Perfect Strangers, um, what, what would you what say would the premise say? of the show is? Uh, I would say it's about Nine Perfect Strangers who <laughs> go on a retreat. I think it's called Tranquillum House. So... We have this uh, head figure played by Nicole Kidman named Masha. And uh, basically it seems like everyone's going there because they're dealing with some kind of problem in their life and they want her to help them and give them enlightenment. And they've heard something about it, but it's kind of like a mysterious place. They don't know exactly what's going to happen to them. And as the show goes on, you figure out that there's more that's going on than meets <laughs> the eye and uh, maybe some questionable methods by this Masha woman. And so that's kind of, I think, the central mystery driving it is exactly how she's going to be helping them. Um, and things just sort of go off the rails as the show goes on. Yeah. Uh, basic premise of the novel, too, except things veer vastly different. Uh, probably around episode four, I would say. It mm -hmm. goes off the rails uh, drastically. <laughs> <laughs> um, the novel sets some really easy train track rails for them and they were like nope they took a <laughs> hard turn uh so i'm gonna let nicole go first on her opinion on this one uh, this is just a warning for this episode we're gonna get a little spoilery spoilers because it's really hard to talk about shows uh, as a whole without without talking about spoilers. So hopefully you guys have seen these shows since they are the top limited series that are going on uh, for 2021. If not, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Um, or skip over it until we get to our second one. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know at what time point that will be, but I'll put it in the timestamp on YouTube maybe. <laughs> but anyway, I'll let Nicole go first. What, were, what was your impression of this? of the show as a whole. Yeah, so I definitely didn't despise it as much as you did. <laughs> Spoiler for your opinion. <laughs> you can already tell how Ashley feels how she's talking about it. Um, I would say that it started off for me where like I didn't have like a bad feeling about it. I think that I did enjoy that I didn't really know where it was going. And again, because I didn't read the book, so it was just like that big mystery. So I was like very into it, I think, for the opening episodes. Uh -huh. um, but overall, I feel like my opinion on it would be that, you know, you're saying that they had a map with the book. And I feel like even if they were gonna do exactly what happened with the book, it just very much felt like something that easily couldn't, it could have not been as bad. As it ended up being. <laughs> yeah, yes. like that's what that it is. That is absolutely true. That is okay. so true. Uh, I think that the acting was pretty up there. Uh, yeah. it, I mean, Michael Shannon is always amazing. He he plays Napoleon, um, kind of this nerdy teacher father, and he does a spectacular job. Uh, Nicole Kidman actually gets better when she drops the accent a little bit. Uh, yeah. I don't know if Russian is really her forte. <laughs> no, I mean, I will say that I didn't mind the accent so much because I think that she's just that great of an actor that I kind of started forgetting about it. I know that a lot of people I saw them were like, I can't even watch this. <laughs> like, I can't even get through this with the accent. But I would say, also, yeah, Melissa McCarthy, Bobby Cannavale, like, the acting was really good. Samara Weaving, like, I think the whole cast. Like, there was no one really in the cast that I would say, like, oh, they're doing a bad job. I think it was the true. writing. That's true. I don't true. think anybody, yeah. It's a solid cast. It's not a solid script. Uh, I, I don't know how many times <laughs> no. I have to say this. I mean, David E. Kelly's probably never listening to this show, but... Dude, you don't have to make everything dramatic. Like, 
when some when people go through traumatic events, the characters already have traumatic backstories, and they're going to Trick Willem House, and that's also a dramatic kind of setting. And you have your weird Masha spirit guide, basically, who Nicole Kimmon is playing. You've already got everything heightened. It's all there. Your Lego pieces are all there already. You don't, you just have to play with them. You don't need to be like, you know what would be great? If we made these Legos the size of, you know, houses. Like, <laughs> it's not necessary. Uh, the drama is just, he took the dial and he did it, the same thing in Big Little Lies. Is he took the dial from a 10 and it's like, I'm just going to jack this up to 500,000. Um for no reason other than I think dramatic TV is better, but it verges on soap opera at times. Yeah. And he, like, he has a history, and I was reading that, like, he's kind of famous for not really collaborating writing-wise, and, like, there was a show, he did Picket Fences, and there were writers on there that were saying that, like, there was no point in having a writing staff because he just would do whatever he wanted, and especially at the beginning and would sort of like, and then maybe later have people come in and have thoughts and stuff, but he kind of just does what he wants. Um, that always sounds always, great for yeah. working on a team. What a <laughs> Because yes, that it, it makes sense with some of the things you're talking about that somebody might be like, maybe we don't need this. You yeah. know, like maybe we should cut this out. That's um, true. If you had somebody on your writing staff that said, hey, no, that doesn't seem necessary, but you, you don't listen. Yeah. It's not going <laughs> to... So I guess that we uh, we kind of have an idea of why uh, why David E. Kelly's writing is like this. Um, and it's a shame because you've got some talent here. You've got talented actors. You have a, a, a talented... The director, honestly, is a little strange to me. I don't... I, I, I like all of the movies that uh, Jonathan uh, Levine has done. I'm not saying that he couldn't have directed this well um i just think that the writing is over dramatic towards towards the point of a soap opera then you have a cinematographer who is extremely talented um so but his his cinematography is kind of dramatic in and of itself like Mm -hmm. visually his cinematography is dramatic so when you have like if you pair like the writing of Arrival, say, with his cinematography, it works really well because the writing for Arrival is subtle, you know? Yeah. It's a very quiet, like slow burn, subtle film. So then you add his cinematography and his visuals are so um, stunning and dramatic and that it, like, it goes so well together. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's kind of the other, you know, the other films that he's done, it works really well. But I don't know if his beautiful cinematography, and I would even mm-hmm. call his, like, his visuals stunning. Like, they st- li- quite literally stun you in how, like, he is captured an image. Mm-hmm. But when everything else is at 500,000 amps, like, <laughs> I don't know what 500,000 amps is, so don't, like, <laughs> quote me on, like, that. But, like, when everything is at such already a high decibel, like, You don't need the visuals. Like, you have to choose one or the other, I feel. Like, you can't have both in combination with each other because hmm. it's becoming now even more dramatic. It, yeah, I think that it's all so extreme. Like, all (laughs) like, when you're watching it, just, like, everything together, it's almost kind of jarring to, like, watch it. Like, it's just too much all around. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, there's a lot of things just not working in its favor. Um, I think the things that are working for me are Melissa McCarthy's uh, storyline and Bonnie, uh, Bonnie, Bobby, Bobby Cannavale's. Um, they're the two characters that feel real. <laughs> um, they don't feel over dramatic, and the reason for that is. I mean, they're taken basically or like right from the novel. They're the only characters yeah. actually that uh, I would say uh, adapted the characters pretty true. They're pretty spot on with their their uh, versions of their characters. So that makes sense why I like that the best. 
Uh, yeah. And I feel like out of anyone aside from Nicole Kidman and the Marconis, the family, you know, with Michael Shannon and stuff, like they get the most screen time, like Melissa McCarthy and Bobby Cannavale. They do. I think that they did know. It's like they're making bad choices. <laughs> or David e. Kelly was making bad choices, but I feel like also knew like this is probably the best part of this, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely... I don't know if it was, like, in the editing room. They might, Maybe they realized it. <laughs> and they were like, wow, yeah. these two are really shining here. Um, and they... Yeah, they kind of propel the show forward. They, they wrap it up, too, in a way. They're two characters, you know, and we yeah. get to the last two episodes, which, by the way, we get to, like, episode four... And and get, I don't like being the person like, this isn't the same exact thing as the novel. That's not the kind of person I am, actually. I'm pretty open-minded when it comes to adaptations. I realize that it, you can't always fit in everything um, that a novel has in um, a TV show or a film. That's just impossible what novels can capture that film can't. But to take... There's just so many additions. There's just so many additions to the novel that it's creative freedom, but creative freedom in like the wrong way. Um, Masha's character is already really extreme. <laughs> we don't need her to have been shot, and we don't need the character who have shot her to be, you know, um, Tiffany. I'm gonna. What am I? I'm not Tiffany Boone. It's Delilah. Um, Regina Hall. We Delilah. don't need like well, Delilah's another character, which I actually didn't mind. Her character was much sp- smaller in the novel, but I actually really liked her in in, in the, the in the show. I actually think she was a, a strong point in the show. So like, I guess not all additions are bad, but her addition wasn't necessarily dramatic. Is the difference? Um, whereas like Masha's yeah. added things to her character. Like this character is already an extreme character, and then let's. Amp it up to, again, 500,000. And Regina Hall has now shot. We find out, like, later on that Regina Hall shot Masha. But she like, dressed up as a man and then shot Masha. Um, and, and she puts in a contact as well. Are we supposed to assume that? Yeah, that also seems so unnecessary. She right? does put in colored contacts. And that's how she reveals that she shot Masha. I don't even know why she did that. I guess it's part of a disguise. But, like... The whole thing's unnecessary. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So is the eye, I, had, I was confused about this. Is the eye, her eye is the silver eye of the shooter or and she puts in brown contacts or she put in weird looking eyes to be the shooter? No, I think she put in weird looking eyes to be the shooter. See, like, that's how, like, <laughs> this is how unnecessary that yeah. is. Because, I didn't like, think about that until we were talking about it, but. She, like, why am I having did. this question? Like, we should have to question stupid things like this. And this is, this reveal happens, what, in episode six? Yeah, very close to the end. How many episodes are there? Seven? I think there's seven, yeah. There are seven episodes, and this reveal happens in episode six, and, it, but, like, it's ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> like this, this makes no sense. Here, just is just here's the thing. Because again, I don't need it to be exactly the novel. If you make choices that make the story better, that's totally fine. Totally do that. Make the story better. But when you make choices like Masha got shot by Carmel, <laughs> like why? Why can't you just keep it that Ma- Masha was highly unhealthy in that old business role she worked in and she had a heart attack? Why the hell does she need to get shot? <laughs> like, <laughs> what is that? She still had to get her, like, open heart surgery to revive yeah. her in the novel. I don't understand that. Why do we have to connect the shooter to be Carmel? Why can't you just actually make Carmel's character good? Like, why does she have to be insane i don't know i mean well because so that whole thing with the shooter that i think is supposed to be like obviously really connected to them having her have like a stalker like there's somebody there that's like leaving right. threatening messages which is that even in the book no she doesn't have a no stalker. actually <laughs> no she's she's just getting emails from her ex-husband and oh, they're not threatening they're just trying to connect with her 
Yeah, see, like, so that whole thing, too, it felt like they just kept feeling, we need another mystery. We need another mystery. Yeah. And, like, I feel like whatever was going on in all their personal journeys was enough, like you were saying. So we have that, and then it's tied in, and then it's like, okay, it was Carmel... And so this is the person that's been coming after you. But what I also hate is that they have a lot of stuff that's really dramatic, but then like it didn't matter like at all. Yeah. And like with Carmel, she kind of confronts her and then Carmel kind of falls apart. Like she's not aggressive about it. She's like very apologetic. Mm -hmm. And then she like locks her away for a while. Like nothing happens with it. Do you know what I mean? Like it really didn't mean anything. I think it's just supposed to show that Masha is like very forgiving and she loves everyone, even someone who shot her. But it served no purpose. It also ruined Carmel's character. It did. It had no kind of closure. We never really dealt with that. And I feel like it was enough, like what you were talking about, how she was in the book and that she was, they were exploring like how she's very damaged and she has a lot of trauma. Yeah, like rightly so. You would have a lot of insecurities. You would have a hard time getting back on your feet after your husband leaves you for a younger woman. That that is enough. That's what I'm trying to say about David E. Kelly's adaptations of novels are not working for me because Mm. Leah Moriarty as a novelist has already given these characters everything you could possibly need to make it dramatic. You just have to look at these characters and their stories and go, how can I tell this well? Not how can I make this even more of a mystery, even more dramatic. You literally just have to look at it and go, how do I visually tell this character's um, emotional issues? There's enough there already. I mean, all of these characters have major things going on. Uh, They even left out, um, they really did, uh, Ben and, um, was it Jessica was her name in the show? Samara Weaving's characters. They kind of did them dirty too. Like they don't all end, they don't end happy-go-lucky. I mean, they won the lottery and then... Uh, Samara Weaving's character in the novel starts getting plastic surgery and has changed her looks because she's kind of gotten obsessed with her image and social media and Ben doesn't like that anymore and Ben doesn't can't really even look at her anymore <laughs> because he doesn't like the face that he sees now. It's not the woman he fell in love with. Uh, and that already is dramatic. Like, why, why yeah. would you... Honestly, and I look at their storyline and all it goes is, oh, they're not having sex anymore. That's all we need to know about that. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you take those two things, wouldn't you think the story of we won the lotto, we have all this money, so now we're changing our looks and we're kind of changing ourselves. And, like, they touch on it a little bit in the show. But wouldn't you think that's a much more um, emotional weighty story to tell than the one they told yeah i do and (laughs) there's like a glimmer of it like i think there is a scene where she's looking in the mirror and she i think she her nose falls off right when they start like you know yes like that kind of thing and that was really interesting to me i'm like okay obviously you know they're playing with like her plastic surgery stuff and how she views herself but then yeah he's like it's dropped even that turns into like for laughs he's like look your nose is on your face you know <laughs> like which is really cute but yeah the rest of it going forward is just like they're not having sex anymore and then at the end and that's they, all that matters yeah they kind of tack on that I guess they take over Tranquilum House if that's how you understand the yeah, ending and then it's like oh are you trying to leave the door open for another season yeah yeah I think slightly that's what they were doing yes yeah but yeah, there's so many things that already are enough that I found very interesting. Mm. Even the Marconis and like what they're dealing with, like that was part of it sometimes. That's why I'm I'm not like you where I'm just like, this is a trash. <laughs> <laughs> there were real moments like of emotion. And I, and I think that goes back to the acting, like having to do with the family and then her losing her daughter where I felt like I'm like, oh, okay. Like I would have those moments of like, oh, okay. But even that, as it went on, I was like, you're really mishandling this. But they were like, they were glimmers where I could see where it would have been really good. And that's also why I kept watching, you know, because I feel like you could have stopped. But I wanted to see how that was all going to pan out. And I felt like the performances were enough for me that I was still interested. I mean, Michael Shannon, yes, will always be enough for me. Um, But I honestly, I hit episode five, I think, and I was like, Oh man, if we weren't talking about this, I would junk this show. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I was 
I really was like, what is this garbage fire? Like, how do you take actually very heavy, weighty material and you trivialize it? Like, I know they tried to do you know, um, the Marconi's son suicide correctly. Like, I did feel like they were trying to do it correctly, but they still really missed the mark. Uh, and I have to... Boy, I hope we never get popular and David E. Kelly hears <laughs> this because we're so screwed. We're so screwed. He would never be on our show. Uh, but I don't know how you can miss the mark so hard on issues that need to be handled emotionally correctly. Yeah. It's like he's a robot and he doesn't understand how humans work. It's or he's or insult. he or he's too afraid. Or he's too afraid to like really dive into it and really get into the hard stuff. Because that's what I felt like this show did. I feel like it skimmed over all the hard things and it focused on the drama and the mystery. And yeah, and it skimmed over all of its meat. It, it was like eating a chicken wing without meat. Like it was just like, let me just suck on this bone. <laughs> what an excellent metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and we're not going to talk about this show right now but i'm thinking of the undoing which was another david e kelly thing and that's like for anybody that watched it i would say that's another shining example of what you're saying that like he's not there that's the example where i feel like there was a story there that was very emotionally rich and he just climbed the ladder above it and he's like no and he, just <laughs> like, he just decided like let me yes let's make it like what's actually going on the mystery and like red herrings and like just the complete story that I did not care about. And then we're doing all these other things that don't really matter. And this was better, I would say, in that aspect where, again, I feel like there was more of where you could see where would have been good. Like you could see the map, the original. Yeah. Uh, yes, I could see that. Um, I, I'd probably be a little bit easier on it if I hadn't read the novel. But I don't know if I would have been that much easier on it i mean we get to like episode five and they find out they've been microdosed and we've got another like three episodes to go or is it episode four like they find out they're being microdosed by M masha halfway through the season yeah why 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 does that reveal need to be so early i actually feel like that's kind of dumb and they're like, let's just lean into this microdosing thing and let's go play with everybody's hallucinations. Yeah. And it's like, because they were trying to use the hallucinations to uh, help with the character building, I almost thought. But I feel like that would have been better, like character development would have been better utilized through flashback. Especially with Zach. Yeah. Especially with Zach. We needed flashbacks of the Marconis. Uh, honestly, I, you know what? I figured it out. The show needed flashbacks. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. That's all that it needed. That's all it needed. I could be yeah. David E. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes a lot of the hallucinations too. I think were played for laughs. That's also uh, yeah. I'm thinking now about like when you were talking about the director being a weird choice, and that it's not really a comedy, but there are moments where it definitely is supposed to be funny, which yes, if maybe they were trying to balance like the heavier, like the Marconi storyline or what's going on with Masha, like that's very heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. But that was weird to me when we'd have a hallucination of like a little dancing man. And then we go into like so dramatic of like, who's responsible for the suicide. I mean, and it was like, yeah, whiplash, yeah. like tonally. Though I will say, I really did appreciate the cabaret funny, the little funny little guy. <laughs> But, like, at the same time, he's like, what song from Cabaret was it? I don't know. Was it this one? Was it this one? The song is literally money, guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> you would have figured it out. You would have figured it out. You wouldn't have just kept asking what's, uh, like, going through the Cabaret songs. Like, come on. that That's why that joke actually didn't hit when it finally landed. Because the song is money in Cabaret. I think Melissa McCarthy's character, if she knew if, if she knew it was from Cabaret, she would know the song's name was Money. Mm. <laughs> or if she didn't, she would be like, you know, the one with money in it. Because that's the whole chorus. <laughs> Sorry. 
Anyway, besides me appreciating the little, her husband actually, (laughs) McCarthy's husband, (laughs) um, doing a nice little cabaret money (laughs) rendition. Um, Yeah, it was, there's kind of, see, and I think that that's a hard, uh, and this is where I'm going to give anybody who tackles Leanne Moriarty novels credit. She is actually very good at being funny while tackling really hard issues. Mm -hmm. And that's a really hard, fine line to walk. And she can do it. Mm -hmm. But other people (laughs) can't. But other people haven't. And they're not very good at it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the issue we ran into here is there were comedic aspects that could be really funny, mainly McCarthy and Cannavale. They were hilarious together. But when you tried to do it with other characters, it didn't really work very well because you don't know how to handle comedy and drama at the same time. Like, that's kind of what it showed, is like, this show doesn't know how to handle the two Yeah. at the same time. No, it wasn't a good balance. No. It was very jarring. Anyway, do you have anything else to say about, about Nine Perfect <laughs> Strangers? Like, do you think we tackled really why i mean why was it the top in the top shows of the year i know a lot of people saw it i know a lot of people liked it a lot of people enjoyed the mystery i think the cast was the big draw for everybody oh yes and i mean yeah if nicole you, kidman especially yeah i mean though when the accent toned down what was it in episode six where she's going to like microdose with the Marconis and mm-hmm. she's like sitting in that therapy kind of session and they're filming it and the accent is like close to dropped. Yeah. That was the best she did the entire show, <laughs> in my opinion. You think she wasn't putting so much energy in trying to yeah, keep, she had it to up. keep yeah. the accent up. Like when she was just doing her thing, that's when it was you're like, oh, this is Nicole Kidman in her, yeah. in her comfort zone. Um, I I just uh, all I can think going forward is I hope that Nicole Kimmon still does Leanne Moriarty stuff. I hope the two of them stay in partnership with each other. And I know this is not gonna happen. This is just wishful thinking because everybody loves these shows so much. Like Big Little Eyes, everybody loved they got a second season. The second season was trash. I don't know how people felt about it. People still watch season two. I don't think they're having a season three. I don't think so. Um, Based on season two. <laughs> uh, Nine Perfect Strangers. It looks like they're leaving the door open for a season two. It's wishful thinking for me to think David E. Kelly won't be a part of these productions going forward. Mm. But it seems like him, Kidman, and Moriarty are all in are all in it together now. Yeah. But my wish would be for someone to look at his writing and go, you know what, this isn't really up to snuff, especially when it comes to women's issues. Like, especially when it comes to women characters, you're not good at them. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What were we saying a while back um, about... Who did we say, like, can you imagine... We were just talking on the phone about it. And and I, and I think I said, can you imagine if this was in the hands of what female writer did I say? Um, Fleabag, who is it? Um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. So, yeah. yeah. So, like, say the showrunner here was um, Promising Young Woman. You got to help me out again. I'm keep blanking on everybody. Emerald Fennel. There you go. Okay. So, can you imagine if these Leanne Moriarty stories were in the hands of a team who did like Killing Eve, right? That's still kind of in the same genre, right? Mm -hmm. Like their Killing Eve is this thriller kind of tackling emotional issues. Can you imagine if you had a duo like them or showrunners like them working on Leanne Moriarty novels? Like, can you imagine how much better Nine Perfect Strangers would have been handled by one of them or both of them or really only one of them you could have taken either one yeah. and but like that if you can imagine like big little eyes wouldn't have been so mishandled 
And and I know a lot of people love Big Little Lies, but when we rewatched it and then we had our this was back on the original Park Lounge, our conversation with it, and we looked over it and we went, wait a minute, they actually did a pretty bad job <laughs> um, on handling yeah. stories correctly. It's just I don't I know it's not gonna happen. It's total like pipe dream that David E. Kelly is gonna be disattached from them at some point. Yeah. But that would be my like that would be mean more than anything to me. <laughs> no, I would watch. I would watch that. I mean, I watched this too, but I would watch that. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch that and I would enjoy it, but I can already start imagining what that would look like. Basically just what I wish this had been. And I can see just like every choice that would have been made where it's <laughs> just imagine them reeling it back in. Like maybe we don't need to do that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe uh, Regina Hall's character doesn't have to put in a fake contact <laughs> and a hood and a man. To, oh gosh. Anyway, yeah. let's move on. Let's move on. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't don't want to talk about Nine Perfect Strangers. <laughs> it was a big thing in 2021. Uh, watch it. You're not missing anything if you didn't. Hopefully, if you listen to us, it gives you everything you want to hear about it. <laughs> Maybe it convinced you not to watch it. <laughs>